أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين So continuing our discussion on Abu Hassan ibn Ibrahim al-Rafi'i al-Qazwini I wanted to just talk a little bit about one of his treaties that he wrote on the first two ayat of Surah Yunus where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alif Lam Ra Tilka ayatu al-kitab al-hakim Akana lil nasi ajaban an awhayna ila rajulin minhum an andir al-nas wa bashir al-ladhina amanu anna lahum qadam sidqin inda rabbihim qala al-kafirun inna hadha lasahirun mubin which translates as Alif Lam Ra these or those are the verses of the wise book. Have the people been amazed that we revealed revelation to a man from among them, saying, Warn mankind and give good tidings to those who believe that they have a firm precedence of honor with their Lord. But the disbelievers say, Indeed, this is an obvious magician. So when um, Abul Hassan al Rafi'i al Qazwini comes to talk about this. These couple of ayat, he wrote a treatise called Tafsir Shukmi ala ayatain al awwalain min surat Yunus, which means a um, philosophical uh, interpretation of the two uh, verses of the, the beginning two verses of Surat Yunus. So he starts. We're not talking about the Bismillah because, of course, the Bismillah is its own discussion. He starts with Alif Lam Ra. And he explains that the Anbiya and the Awliya, those people that are able to comprehend the real deep secrets of the Holy Quran, sometimes are unable to express what they witness on those deep realities. And for that reason, they don't necessarily give a full explanation but they sometimes express it with something called isharat isharat are indications they indicate towards those realities that are um, deeper within the metaphysical realms and so for example when we see in the ahadith that alif, ra, alif lam ra has been explained as an allah ar rauf so the alif for ana, the lam for Allah, and the ra for ar rauf What he says here is that although this is an expression, and the kind of expression that the anbiya and the awliya, meaning the a'imma alayhim salam, could express for these deep realities, they themselves obviously witness the reality of what they're saying. So this is his point here that, while you might see in the riwayat an explanation of Alif Lam Ra as a certain phrase, that is not the limit of what those symbols mean. That's not the limit of what Alif Lam Ra means. It's not the limit of what Alif Lam Mim means. If you see in other riwayat that a certain uh, expression has been given for what they mean, and so on and so forth. So this is the first point that he makes, that the Anbiya cannot express everything that they witness and they are ordered to just speak to people at the level of their intellect so when we see these verses and when we see the ahadith that are explaining them we should be aware of this issue then he goes to the meaning of tilka now as you know tilka is a expression that is used or a pronoun that is used for distance and we have the same thing in the beginning of the Holy Quran where we see ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ in uh, Surah Al-Baqarah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the pronoun for distance whereas what we're talking about is something that is right in front of us so in this instance Alif Lam Ra are the ayat that are in front of us but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the pronoun for distance saying tilka and in the same case with in the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ We have the kitab which is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in front of our hands. 
So ذلك الكتاب again is a pronoun for distance for something that we have in our hands. So the pronoun for distance tells us that what is being indicated towards are those deeper metaphysical secrets and meanings. So when we see Alif Lam Ra, Tilka Ayatul Kitab, Masalan, or Tilka Ayatul Kitab, this is what we have here. These, these are the verses of the book. The verses of the book here are indicating towards those deeper meanings. So that's the second point that he makes here on the issue of Tilka. As for Ayat, Ayat are those things that are expressed. And so the symbols that are behind Alif Lam Ra are explained as these specific huruf or these specific letters that we see in the beginning of the surah. So tilka ayat, the ayat here being Alif Lam Ra, which are indicating towards those deeper realities that are behind them. Then when he comes on to speak about Al-Kitab, he's talking about, of course, here, the Kitab Allah, which can have two meanings. Number one, the existential Kitab Allah, which is the creation, and the Kitab Allah, which is the book of the Holy Quran that we hold in front of our hands. So as you can see here, there are two levels in, in a general sense that he's talking about. The level that is behind, if you like, or the level that is the secrets behind the Holy Quran and the Holy Quran itself. And the words that are being used here can apply to both. So while he doesn't move away from the outward meaning of the Holy Quran, he's also indicating was towards the deeper meanings that are behind it. And this is one of the principles of mystical interpretation, that a mystical interpretation shouldn't come out of the outward meaning of what is being said in the verses of the Holy Quran. Then he comes to speak about the word Al-Hakim, because as the ayah says, Tilka ayatul kitab al-Hakim. And what he says here is that the Holy Quran contains both the wisdom that is the wisdom of uh, theoretical wisdom and the practical wisdom as well. This is one meaning of Hakim. The other meaning of Hakim here, he says, is Muhkam, <clears throat> which means that it's firmness will not be, uh, you know, its firmness in terms of its uh, theoretical strength would not be undone by a number of doubts and questions about it. So this is another uh, meaning of Hakim. And yet another meaning is that it is a book that will not be distorted. Because again, another meaning of Muhkam here, according to Rafi al-Qazwini, is that it is a book that will not be distorted in any way. And the reason for that is also because the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not limited to the outward book that we have, the written, the written version of the book that we have. Rather, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is linked to the existential book, which is something that covers all of the different realms. And of course, while you might be able to... Um, you might be able to distort a written book. There is no way that you can distort the book of existence. So the book of existence is something that will never be changed. And this is what it means here in the terms of the kitab being Hakim. The book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with Hakim here having the meaning of muhkam, Meaning that it is firm. Meaning that it is something that will not be changed by anyone. Or the next meaning that he also offers for Hakim is that it is a book that speaks with wisdom. So, An-Natiq Bil-Hikam. So, here again is another meaning that he gives in terms of the divine secrets that are contained within the Holy Quran. And then he moves on to an Irfani principle where there is a relationship between the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which expresses the whole of existence and the spirit of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, which is the most perfect compilation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names. And then he gives an indication to where a person can read and understand about these issues more, and he references the third safar of the Asfar al-Arba'a written by Mullah Sadra, and also the book Mafatih al-Ghayb, where Mullah Sadra has noted 
many of the principles that one would use for the tafsir of the Holy Quran. But he doesn't just reference the books. Here he says that somebody who wants to really get to grips with what Mullah Sadra is saying is that they should take that understanding from somebody who understands it. A teacher who is a specialist, a teacher who has really understood the meaning of the Asfar so that a person is not confused by their own understanding because the book of the Asfar has many many secrets within it and of course the uninitiated or the people that generally haven't really got to grips with what the Asfar is talking about may not fully understand or may not fully comprehend what Mullah Sadra is trying to say within this work so now he moves on to the next verse and the next verse talks about how the kafirin take issue with the Holy Prophet وسلم, or indeed any man as receiving revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he starts to explain that this is one of the, sh- the kind of doubts that was obviously there and that doubt was that they did not think that it was possible for a human being and while human beings are all equal amongst themselves, how is it possible for a human being to be able to lead other members of society? And how is it possible that other human beings should obey another human being? Except if it was, of course, by power and they were a king or something like that. Then you're forced, um, you know, from a military perspective. But if it was to do with just following somebody out of your own choice, why would you ever do that? Because all human beings are equal. This is a question that was on the Kafirin's mind. And of course, the question that also occurs in the modern mind as well. Why should we really follow another human being on any issue, on any issue whatsoever? And the answer that the Holy Quran gives to this is that people are not equal. They're, yes, they're equal in the sense that in their humanity they're equal, but people and the nature of people and the perfection of people is something that is graded, something that is not the same for each person. When it comes to, of course, the fact that they're a human being, their physical body, and so on and so forth, yes, there is an equality among human beings. All human beings have physical needs, all human beings have bodies, all human beings have a shared experience in the material world in some way or another, but when it comes to the soul of a person, that is something that is quite different. And the soul of Rasulullah wasallam was a soul that was connected to the deeper spiritual realms. And so it is because of his spirit and because of his soul and because of his intellect, which was much higher and connected to the realities and his heart, which contained all of the beautiful akhlaq and his soul, which had perfected all of the different capabilities and put them all in the right balance. And it was because of the bringing together of all of those different levels and the perfection of all of those levels together that gave the Holy Prophet ﷺ an aspect of difference. The Holy Prophet ﷺ was not the same as everybody else. Yes, in his body, perhaps, but in his soul, absolutely not. So while in his body he could be with them, he could be close to them, it was something in a sense that was needed for human beings to also build a connection with him. That was not his only aspect. But rather that bodily aspect of him was also there for a purpose. It was there so that other human beings could be guided. It was there so that other human beings could also feel like they were interacting with a member of their own species. It was not an angel coming down to tell them what their road of perfection is. Rather, it is a human being that has all of the same concerns as they do on the level of their material existence that then tells them how to progress on this path of spirituality and this path of perfection. So it is by that difference between the Holy Prophet and the rest of humanity that it was necessary to obey him. So he comes back to speak about the actual ayah an awhayna ila rajulin minhum that we would reveal to a man from among them and he speaks about the issue of wahi which as he explains is divine knowledge 
or divine unseen knowledge which manifests in the soul of the Holy Prophet after his connection to those realms and his unification with the Ruh al-Qudus which can also be called the Aql al-Fa'al in philosophical terms and according to the terms of revelation he is called Jibra'il salam. And that connection happens on two parts, in two ways. It happens on the level of the intellect and it happens in the level of the barzakh. Because the intellect is a plane where there is no shape or form. So that, if you like, is the realm of pure knowledge. Whereas the barzakh is a plane where there is shape and form, but that shape and form is not limited in the same way as it is in the material realm. So when the Holy Prophet ﷺ, for example, says that he saw Jibra'il, this happens on the plane of the Barzakh, which is a plane in between the material and the intellectual world, but that that revelation also happens deep within the soul of the Holy Prophet ﷺ in his intellect, where he receives all of those meanings and also the forms that will explain those meanings to people in the material world. And of course, the issue of tamathul, which is where a intellect manifests in the barzakh, is something that is accepted and acceptable, and is another topic that we can talk about at another time. But just to explain what ar rafi al-Qazwini says here, he says that this is possible because of a rule in um, philosophy which is the possibility of something that is greater. Meaning that if Jibra'il islam is present within the intellectual world, then he can also be present within the Barzakh as well. He then moves on to an Andirin Nas. An Andirin Nas, he says, is to warn and to make people understand the precariousness of their situation. Because the human body is a very weak vessel. And because of that, the human being is always closer to death than they are to that eternal life, especially on the material plane. Nobody will exist forever on this material plane, and so they will have to face the consequences of their actions. And as such, it is one of the most important things to warn people and to explain to them that this is an opportunity that they basically cannot treat lightly. It is an opportunity that they have to take into their own hands and this is something that is only done through a kind of warning to bring people out of their blindness they need to be warned and that warning has to be such that it reaches people it cannot be such that people don't hear that warning so this is why one of the main purposes of the holy prophet وسلم, is to warn people to, to tell people that they are in that precarious situation so usually the Holy Prophet ﷺ is explained to have two functions, to warn people and to give them glad tidings. So here he's talking about the issue of warning, but then the next issue is the issue of glad tidings. وَبَشِّرِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنَّ لَهُمْ قَدَبًا صِدْقًا So inshallah, in order to speak more about وَبَشِّرِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنَّ لَهُمْ قَدَبًا صِدْقًا We will speak about that in another video, inshallah. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين